Good morning, everybody. I think we've all assembled now. Um, what a fabulous conference. I've just heard the last speaker. That's my first intro into this conference. And what an absolutely remarkable session that was. And the next session, um, which will be led by Lisa Rihanna, the new artist from New Zealand, is going to be exceptional. I've heard her speak many times before, and she really is a very compelling speaker who speaks about her work, which is absolutely remarkable. So you are in for a treat. Um, first of all, I would like to pay my respects also to the people, the traditional custodians of this land, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, um, upon whose land upon which we meet today. Lisa Rihanna is one of this century's leading international artists, full stop. Born in Auckland, New Zealand in 1964, her powerful work has evolved as one of the most salient expressions of contemporary oceanic art today. In the 90s, the British historian Simon Winchester wrote a remarkable book, which I urge you all to read, called The Pacific, in which he describes the Pacific Ocean as the ocean of the future. And I would argue that contemporary Pacific art is the visual culture of the now and the future. Rihanna is one of the most influential players of a movement within this, which I might call um, oceanic feminism, perhaps. Um, this tendency recasts visual expression through the lens of Pacific women. Not only that, not that of the dusky maiden trope of the 19th century cabinet pictures or the colonial carte de visite, but powerful, potent goddess figures who affect change and influence destiny. This journey began with her seminal work with the collective in Auckland called Pacific Sisters, um, alongside other artists concerned with the unravelling of the male-dominated meta-narratives of Western colonial art practices. And in fact, um, Lisa's just told me that an exhibition which opened in Te Papa last year is about to move to, um, to Auckland, to the Art Gallery of Auckland, um, which is really a survey of the Pacific Sisters. And I would urge anyone who hasn't visited New Zealand or hasn't got engaged with this work before to perhaps make that journey. It's very easy from Australia um, because that would be a remarkable show and really well worth seeing. Um, Lisa went on to create a substantial body of work as a solo artist, including the remarkable digital mare or the meeting space of female ancestral figures in, um, which she made in 2001. And I think I'm right in saying that this is the first work by Lisa that the NGA actually acquired. Um, of course, most art lovers now know Lisa's work through her magnum opus, um, In Pursuit of Venus Infected, which was shown recently at the Asia Pacific Triennial in Queensland and before that at the Venice Biennale in 2017, where she represented New Zealand with this remarkable work. While many people know this work, few may know, in fact, that in, um, its genesis began in this building in 2005, when Lisa was visiting the NGA to see um, Bill Viola's work, The Passions, and she happened to come across in the Oceanic Galleries um, a work from the French Enlightenment period by the um, decorative wallpaper master Joseph Dufour. Um, known as Le Sauvage de la Mer Pacifique, also known as the Voyages of Captain Cook. Um, this work made in 1804 to 06 is in fact a highly innovative decorative panoramic wallpaper in 20 panels, which was designed by Jean-Gabriel Chavet for Dufour. Designed to capture the haute bourgeois market in France and America at the time, who had also taken with um, Captain Cook mania, um, this, this work was made for people to place into their studies and their um, uh, sitting rooms and places like that. And much of the design of this wallpaper was based on a substantial body of work produced by the artist on Cook's last voyage, um, John Weber. Seeing this major example of French Enlightenment visual culture, which is sort of pre-colonial period, was a manifest moment for Lisa, who then went on to research and recast the technology aesthetic, social and political context of the wallpaper into a major digital panorama fit for the 21st century. Thus it is with great pleasure that I welcome to the stage Lisa Rihanna who will discuss this work and her practice. Lisa, welcome to the NGA. We truly look forward to hearing your great insights into your work. Thank you. Kia koto kato ngā mihi nui ki a koto uh, tēnei uh, te fare tui fakare tēnā koto. 
uh, ngā mahi nui ki a uh, nanawao, rawa, ko nambari, tangata whenua, tūturu. Uh, ngā mahi kia koutou uh, to you all. Uh, it's my great pleasure to come and share some insights with you and um, at this moment I'd just like to thank all the organisers of this um, conference. Thank you for bringing me here ever so quickly. Um, but just to um, share some insights about making an artwork that has truly uh, made me feel much more brainy than when I started out. Um, so I started working on this project called In Pursuit of Venus after visiting NGA. And uh, it was very exciting for me as a, um, a young artist. I mean, I was in my, t I suppose, 2005, 15. It took me a long time to even be able to see Bill Viola's work. One of the things about growing up um, in New Zealand, Aotearoa in New Zealand, a lot of the um, artworks that I was looking at, and I was so interested in video because the MTV generation was just coming on. I was really into music and, and style. A lot of uh, resonances um, came to me listening to Sandra's wonderful talk this morning. Um, but I realised that the art history papers that I was taking while I was attending art school, a lot of the works that I was encountering were as um, slide projections and I didn't have, didn't see the originals and often you, there's a flattening out that happens when you're, you know, when you have visual aids such as this. I remember seeing a Salvador Dali and, and it was projected enormously in a, a theatre but when I saw it, it was really tiny, so my encounter with it was really quite different. There was a different um, resonance. So um, I happened to be here. I'd never seen Bill Viola's work up until that point, and I knew there was um, uh, the Passions was here, and um, it was fantastic to see um, this particular work. Uh, and I was... It was the piece where they're diving into the pools. There was this sort of sound, um, and it was like being, it's this kind of immersive feeling about life and death and living and breathing, which I think is so beautiful about Bill Viola's work and has inspired me as a young Maori woman to think about how I've, how to utilize media and my choices of going into the media space. So I went through art school between 1983 and 1987 and at that time there was a lot of um, advocacy and pushing from other Māori elders, uh, Māori speakers um, for um, language retention. We were fighting to get our lands back and some of the really interesting activists were actually moving into theatre and they used theatre as a place to perform, um, to use language and to kind of break down these structures of what um, art galleries and museums and where these performance spaces and where culture can be enacted because New Zealand was colonised by the British. Um, we have a treaty which is still... Um, still being invoked at this time as a way for different tribal groups to get land back or some kind of compensation. So there was a lot of discussion about advocating for 10% of material going into media on television and on radio. And um, I was approached after art school and asked if I would like to join what was called the Kimi Here scheme where a number of Māori were being trained up to work in television to create what has now since become the Māori department at TVNZ. My training was uh, through art school and I felt that um, that documentary um, and the broadcast space would easily function, that there would be a lot of people who would want to uh, receive this training. And what I felt like I wanted to do was to create a space within the visual arts world um, to create, to show ourselves in a different format. And I was thinking about um, 
broadcast culture has a very Western notion about it in the sense that programming might be a half hour or one hour broken up into sections with um, TV commercials inserted in between them. And I really felt like I wanted to look at time and the, the ways that um, an audience can encounter uh, visual material, audio-visual material in a different manner. So I decided that um, I wanted to work in, a, in the gallery and create a space within the gallery for Māori voices. So that's just a kind of a backdrop to the kind of politics that were playing out at the time when I was going through art school. It was a very p politicised time. Um, there was a great push from um, the gay community, and so there were synergies happening in that space. Um, and, and interestingly, with um, some of the religious leaders too, who could see what was happening for Māori, that their voices had been taken away along their lands, etc. So there were some very amazing people that were advocating um, t recognition for Treaty of Waitangi and some of the things that we are still fighting for today. Jumping forward, coming to the National Gallery of Australia, I, um, I happen to see this work here, Les Sauvages de la Mer Pacific. Uh, this is an image taken, I think, about four years ago, just before I was about to do some more... Um, video acquirement for my piece, In Pursuit of Venus. Um, I'm standing here with the, a producer I worked with, Viv Stone. We decided it was really important to fly back and actually view this work once again before we embarked on a major set of um, filming because she hadn't seen this work. And um, it's an amazing uh, fictional utopian vision of the Pacific. Um, this is a racist term to say it's like Chinese whispers, but what I like about this work in a way, when Charvet, the illustrator, started making it, he was looking at the copies of lithographs that were made by the artists who actually visited uh, the Pacific um, pre-treaty times in the, in the late 1700s. And um, there was this kind of the Pacific is constantly being discovered and rediscovered, um, even through the work that I'm making now, in a way, it's like a, a re rediscovery. But these um, fictional uh, costumes are very much inspired by uh, French operas and English plays that uh, started to uh, circulate in this kind of popular fiction through um, England and France in the early um, 1800s. And so I was looking at Chavez's um, entrepreneurial work and thinking about, I wanted to, I had a eureka moment when, once I was looking for a new project to embark on and I really love media but media really is just a tool. Um, you need to have something to say to really make it resonate and um, to dive deeply into it. Um, and I love this image, because I've had several iPhones since this, since this <laughs> image was taken, um, but I love this kind of collapse of time. And it is this collapse of time, which is very interesting to me as um, uh, a Pacific person, a Maori person. We, um, we think of the past, present, and future all possible um, through this, there's a, um, a koru pattern which is called takurangi and it means that we are connected to the past and the future just by virtue of standing here. And um, one of the things that you might notice when you go to New Zealand or if you've heard other speakers, they'll always say, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, oftentimes you look at Māori carving and they have three fingers and that is a reference to the past, present and future. So that kind of collapses time and it's a way of bringing your um, ancestors to protect you where you are and it's to make you cognizant of what you're doing right now and its impact on the future, future generations. So this is me just recording um, 
we went into uh, the, uh, the bowels of NGA and it was spent a lovely couple of hours <laughs> looking at these drawings. I mean, it's, a, it's an extraordinary work um, and it's quite interesting because the figures are actually very small in the work, but I wanted to make a piece that really, when I brought all my community and my people and the people who had agreed to be part of this project, I wanted the encounter to be life-size. Um, so when I embarked on making this project, I spent a year just deciding where the horizon line would sit <coughs> in relation to the, the final composition. Um, and these are those funny compositional devices, but it is really about how do you bring these things to life? How do you make history make sense today? Um, these are some of the figures. These figures are tiny. Some of them are perhaps an inch tall. Um, but the figure on the right-hand side is really one of the major depictions of Aotearoa as a Maori chief, Kaora. And um, when I was working with Rana Devonport when we were preparing this work to take to Venice, one of the things she said to me, and I loved it, she said, oh, Lisa, that's you, because you're looking in. And what uh, the chief is looking at in this particular scene in the wallpaper is the death of Captain Cook. And so it's uh, an amazing and unusual thing to have a death within a, one of these... Um, 18th century Enlightenment wallpapers. But for me, it was the kind of moment, it's the rupture, and it's a really interesting space to revisit and think about because he is a hero and a villain all at once. And that's um, a really postmodern idea, in a sense. And so thinking about these different ways of looking at figures through time um, has been something that I've looked at uh, quite a lot. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just play you a bit first so you know what we're on about.
to start and end with that because we have uh, Darawal Welcome to Country and it finishes with um, a Sydney based artist Amla Groon um, singing a medicine song that her grandmother taught her and one of the things that was very apparent to me as a woman of colour was the there was two things kind of going on at the same time it's an incredibly uh, technical work, but there was also another language of ethics and how to bring people who have been colonised into close proximity and creating, um, I think of the wallpaper as a structure for them to speak back from. But also through the things that I know and I've learnt through time, um, Sometimes it's really difficult. Some people have language and they're very strong in their language and some people don't. And you can embarrass people by putting them on the spot or having an expectation that they might be able to speak in a particular way. So um, what I decided that I would do, I wanted to embark on this project and find a way that I could spend time um, meeting people, learning along the way and being able to bring them into what I could see was going to be um, a really large project where people from many, many cultures had the right to stand and speak from. And to me that's the contemporary notion of this work. But also thinking about being on the shore, a lot of the um, political fights that have happened in New Zealand have been around the foreshore and seabed debate. So the encounters on the shore are this incredible moment of political unrest and upheaval, but also um, incredible curiosity as well. Human beings love to travel. We love to look around the world. We love to encounter new things. Um, it's what we take with us and how we deal with the situations when we arrive there uh, can really push the sort of outcomes that eventuate. This is um, from the very first test shoot that I did. Um, I'm 12 years younger here, and um, I can. And um, actually, it's really lovely. I'm standing next to uh, Dan, who was one of my um, Dominic. Sorry, Dominic Blazer, who used to be one of my students when I taught in art school. I spent 25 years working in the tertiary institute. As I said, I decided that was a, I wanted to create a space in the visual arts for media. So it was a wonderful moment for me to be able to be working alongside one of my students as a colleague. Um, behind me is Feloy, who agreed to come in. She's a dance practitioner, a beautiful woman of Samoan descent. And Sam Tozer, who is kind of like the, the third person in the group who's like a boy genius. He is a camera person and an editor and we've been working alongside each other. We've been collaborating on projects for over 20 years now. 
Um, but we were just, uh, we were, did a negotiation with the South Seas Film School, which seemed like a very appropriate place to begin the project, the process, and they lent us their film studio after the students had, um, had just finished their year. And as a gift back to them, I painted the studio in a green screen paint and left it up and then painted it out so they did an animation um, project first up as they started the year the year following when they came back from school. Um, but we just literally went in, took some lights in. I'd already worked, I'd spent the year working where to put my horizon line and I worked with a, um, a Russian illustrator who created the um, digital uh, background upon which all, this, all these uh, vignettes and these scenes take place. So that was a very, very early experiment for me. But I kind of, a watershed moment because I knew what I needed to do to kind of pull this project together. Um, and one of the things that was, I, I was debating about this idea about authenticity. How authentic can you be at this moment in time? How authentic can you be if people do and don't have language? Um, what kind of costumes do you show? How do you interact with the people that you're bringing close to yourself? So, um, and I didn't want to, I knew that there were scenes that would be in Hawaii because in the original wallpaper, there's um, visuals from people set in Tahiti, um, Nui, uh, Samoa, Tonga, right across the Pacific, right up into Hawaii, of course, where Captain Cook met his demise. And when I looked at this kind of, um, the clothing and the costuming, I realised that I needed to kind of delve deeper and show something like a pre-colonial um, costume rather than having the kind of Hawaiian shirt, you know, falling into that dusky maiden trope, uh, which I didn't want to, it to be. So I worked with a number of people um, and there was this wonderful kind of upskilling um, and sharing of information by bringing people close, the, the information that kind of, um, that uh, volleys backwards and forwards uh, is unbelievably amazing. It's amazing. I mean, we come from New Zealand, so we've got, um, I always joke that I'm an orc from Auckland. Um, we have, you know, the Weta workshop. So there's a really highly skilled crew of people in New Zealand. Um, but these were just people who I would work with. I w um, my ethics were I really wanted to pay everybody something. Um, certainly not the kind of commercial rates that, um, that you would expect in the broadcast or the filmmaking industry. So that kind of meant for me, I was often going off doing exhibitions. Um, I, uh, I was a teacher, full-time teacher while I was making this. Um, so I was spending a lot of time trying to raise funds and then have little moments when I would work with different people and have these kind of intense moments where we'd be filming. Um, and one of the things that I did is I worked with local community. We have um, uh, Pacifica Festival happens um, at, um, I think it must be coming up, January, February, every year. And I heard about um, a Hawaiian group who were traveling through town. So I made sure I timed a shoot so that I could have some Hawaiian people in the, uh, in the work. But of course, then we, when we dress them, they actually look more Tahitian. So this, this thing of authenticity is um, a really interesting and difficult conundrum to work through because I know where I've kind of wavered, um, but I've kind of come to my own understandings um, where I feel uh, comfortable about it in the sense that um, I wanted to invite people to come and respond to this opportunity and to this uh, wallpaper and to this um, work. Um, and I like this shot because what we did is we were beaming in, we were shooting in a green screen situation. Um, most people understand what green screen is. Um, but to try and, uh, we were working in across different buildings and so we beamed in the footage from the studio so people could get a sense of what they were up for and the kind of space they're going into. Because uh, it's like living um, in a billiard hall. I sat for four days shooting into this green screen, digi-green they call it, 
and it does very strange things to your retina. Um, I mean, I experienced the Tyrell last night, and it's kind of a bit like that. You, you lose um, any sense of space and volume. So, um, and for performers, Pacific performers often perform outside in a natural landscape. Um, you don't have the sounds of a room coming back to you. You also have an audience who might be clapping and cheering you on, people, people from your family. So it's a very strange space, a very cold kind of space to ask people to come and perform in. Uh, I also timed it with Pacifica because uh, there were some really amazing tattoo artists were travelling through New Zealand at the time. And uh, as an artist, although this is a, a very historic, it's based on a historic um, work, um, I was really interested where the artists are. And I'm really interested in um, the tattoo work that was happening, that is continuing to happen. Um, particularly for the crew members of Captain Cook. I loved, I've got scenes in there of them receiving um, tattoos because for me it represents a moment where the Tahitian artists are encountering Western illustrative traditions for the first time. So there's this kind of hybridization and there's this sharing of knowledge and there's this shift of knowledge as well. Uh, when I worked with the um, artist, she, I had a design in my head that I really wanted to use. And you see a lot of it now, it's very, um, it's very popular, kind of in the 90s, they call it black work. Um, but when I was talking with, with her, she, um, she was talking about that that black work is actually an erasure. Um, post... Um, religions coming into um, across the islands. There was much more pattern and detail that sat underneath them. So we spent, um, it took sort of a whole day to get Ali, he's very tall, so it took about 10 hours to, to be able to shoot the scene at the end of the day. So this is in process. Um, and because I was trying to be highly efficient with my time and the small amounts of money that I had, I would work with people and they play multiple um, multiple characters um, throughout the work. So as a way of supporting the project, I was also photographing some of the um, characters and then they became portraits that then um, I would sell to put back into um, funding the project, but also as a uh, you know, way of gifting some images back to the people that I was working with. Um, and then, yeah, this is what the green screen looks like. A bit like Kermit the Frog. <laughs> that was very funny to see um, Kermit there. Um, yeah, and sort of thinking about the ethics of working with people, so a number of the dance troops that I was um, bringing in, I didn't want to take away their intellectual IP, so I also brought in a choreographer, Sefa Inari, and so sometimes what, what we would do is we would devise a dance piece just before we recorded it. And what that meant is that we would have something um, unique to the project, but not actually cutting across um, these different groups' work that they're doing out in the community and, and as their form of income. My girlfriend, Therese Mangos, um, was writing a book about um, tattoo culture in um, the Cook Islands, and it happened to be uh, printed while I was working on this project, and there was this one image of what they call the Mangayan Bride, and I really loved this image because it's this idea of the body as a vessel and that the body doesn't touch the ground. You walk across the backs of other people as you're being delivered into this new life. Um, in Maoridom, there's a really horrific thing that used to happen. On a maiden voyage of a waka, slaves would be laid down on the ground and the waka would be conveyed to the water and would often crack and break the backs of the people lying underneath it. They were used as skids. And so I thought this was a really interesting image that talked to me about the ways that Pacific uh, traditions um, evolved and changed and moved as, as we moved to different parts around the, the island. Needless to say, they didn't, we didn't break their backs, but... Um, <laughs> 
it was a really interesting to, thing to behold. Uh, so this is a very low resolution image taken from the Dufour wallpaper. But um, this is the sort of imagery that I was trying to speak back to and bring another um, feeling uh, that was taken from an indigenous position. So these are these kind of three ballerinas, um, like based on the three graces, so this kind of Western tradition. And what I did was I worked with, uh, this is the Sexy Savages, um, a dance group of three women who, um, who work together. And what I, what I wanted to create was this idea of not performing for an audience as such, but performing for your own joy and your own bliss. So these um, women are dancing with each other, teasing each other and, and, and learning um, their dance moves together, which is kind of trying to cut across this idea of everything's performed outwards to the audience. Oh, this is the image um, that I was describing before, um, walking across the backs of the villages. So it's really, um, although this is a very traditional looking image, it was a way that I could support this um, uh, re recently found illustration that Therese had uh, printed in her book to support this um, um, investigation and, and this cultural knowledge and starting to bring it to light and to show it off in many multiple formats because some people wouldn't buy the book. It was just another way of bringing these ideas out into, into the open, into the kind of popular culture. Um, and what I, it was quite a strange project to work on. It was about um, trust. So I invited people to come. I had, I did probably a, about eight days worth of filming over five years. But I invited people to come and we had some books there. And this is Aruna Poaching who um, teaches hula da uh, dancing. And she was looking through one of the books that was there and loved this um, illustration. I think it's by Grisson. It's a French illustration of a seated hula, and she said, this is the piece that I want to do. And so our job was to kind of respond to the hopes and aspirations of the people who were turning up, you know, who came to support the, the, this project and to, to bring them and let them speak and represent themselves the way that they wanted to. So this is just to kind of give you a, um, a sense of this Aruna there. She's been recorded against the green screen. We dial her out and drop her into this um, utopian Tahitian landscape. What I love about this, um, the landscape, is that it becomes a ground. It becomes um, the platform from which every different culture every person who's in the work has the right to speak. And that's something that's very much inspired from Māoridom. For me, when I go into a meeting house or a whare nui, when you're inside the meeting house, everybody has the right to, to stand and talk. And so I love that kind of flattening out the, the lack of kind of hierarchy that sits within the meeting house. So I think that was something that was really important to me in making this work. Um, I was lucky enough to do a residency up in Montalvo, and while I was up there, it really made me think about um, Nootka Sound, um, the people up there, because of course Captain Cook was looking for the Northwest Passage, and um, just to really think about these um, heroic characters, and imagine what it might have been like for them to encounter these sort of different situations. And through that, I was um, then writing scripts. It was an opportunity for me to think about script writing, but also in a, in a kind of a performative way. Um, I don't have formal training in that sense. I come from a background when I was at art school. I did a lot of animation work. I love animation because I think it's about magic and bringing things to life. Um, you can make work very compelling. You can 
um, and then hit them with a sort of um, a political undertone. Um, but I'm not, you know, I feel like an activist, I have a political stance, but it's sort of, it's a very, um, it's a very measured way. It's just like trying to bring people into a space and to allow them to look at what's happening, see, encounter history in a very different way. So the floggings were really interesting to me and I did a whole series of different floggings in the work. Um, and there's a series of, of course, raising the flag. I know there's some very famous works that have been um, re-looked at by um, other Aboriginal artists here and um, my thing was having a very limp Union Jack being constantly um, <laughs> set up the flagpole. Um, the other thing that I like to do is work with family. So um, this is my niece Ruby on the left hand side and it was when I, I had to get some hats made. So lucky there's a fantastic um, company called Hills Hats in Wellington and um, they make tricorn and bicorn hats. And it was one of the things that I couldn't find anywhere to rent. So I actually had these um, hats made and she made me feel very happy every day that I went into work. Um, sometimes when I was feeling uh, quite overwhelmed by the process, and she would just look at me and smile and say, come on, auntie, we can just get through this thing. And she helped me um, bring in a number of uh, Pacific students and actors. Uh, she works a lot in the theatre world. And this is her dad, Des, my brother-in-law. And so he was the chef for the project. And um, one of the things that I wanted to do was when Captain Cook went to Hawaii, he um, involved himself, he kind of went native, and because um, he was there during um, the cult of Lono, or you know, it's the, it's the middle of summer, and um, pigs are chiefly food. So I also commissioned a hunter to go out and get a Captain Cook pig, um, so that we could include that in the scene that I shot. Because I think it's really useful to think about these sorts of foods and things that were being gifted and traded around the islands. Because when you think of pigs, often people think of them as pink, fat, crate-fed pigs. But actually, this is a, a cooker. And um, he was really delicious. We ate him at the end of the weekend afterwards because... Um, um, although he did get killed in the making of it, he, he was honoured by, um, he fed all my family. We, we hosted um, a dinner afterwards and everybody uh, partook in it. Anyway, I love this photo because it's just sort of the kind of levels that it's worthwhile going to because the sort of people that you meet along the way, it's um, very interesting. I worked with uh, a whole bunch of actors and I actually involved myself with a group called PIPA. This is a Pacific Island performing arts group and uh, worked with the second year students and it was a really wonderful thing to include them in the process because what we did is we um, paid everybody in cash at the end of the weekend and it was really wonderful seeing them draped around the studio fanning themselves with dollar bills and talking about how they're going to catch taxis home and what a big deal it meant for them. Uh, but it also, when I went back and worked with the, um, the, student, uh, the staff and worked with the students again at the end of the year, it really changed their... Um, it really changed them and the ones that were involved in the project have continued on to uh, involve themselves in either writing, performing um, and acting. So um, it's the sort of reverberations that come out from working across communities. Um, this is what it looks like to film in the studio. This is just a, a series of images. Um, I work with dramaturgs. Um, you can see the green is quite leery and quite strange. But um, it was really interesting. I worked just this image back here. I'm in the back with a crazy trousers and this is um, Rachel House who's next to me and I've, I worked with her, I, I filmed her about 30 years ago and I always thought she was an amazing actress and she's gone on to do 
lots of fabulous things, and she's been working with Taika Waititi, and she's in Moana. She voices the grandmother. Um, she's got a beautiful speaking <laughs> voice, and I asked Rachel if she would work with me on this project, and um, and it was interesting because she locked me out of the room. Like when she started working with the actors, we had a weekend to train them. Um, to talk through the hopes and aspirations that I had from the scripts that I'd written, and then I got banned from the room. So I never knew what was going to come up when I came to do the shoot. Um, for me, In Pursuit of Venus was an opportunity to think about the heroes and uh, one of the heroes of our history is the Tahitian Tupaia or Tupaia, who travelled with Captain Cook. Um, and he has a very, very interesting story. Um, he's Arioi. Um, he left, he departed Tahiti and chose to travel with Captain Cook and really um, created the conditions that made it possible for Cook to encounter so many different people through the Pacific because we, essentially it's one language with different dialects that they're very, very similar from, uh, they call it Cook Island Maori, Maori, Tahitian, Samoan, there's, there's, it's a root language. So he opened up the opportunities to, for Cook to meet people. And in this scene, I have him talking to a Maori chief. Um, this is my friend's father, Mikara. And one of the things that um, is very sad that Banks didn't pick up on when they were sharing time in the Grand Cabin is that Tupaya drew, um, he, uh, drew a map of the Pacific and told him stories about how Pacific people navigated across the oceans. So we were never discovered, we were always there, but he was a great knowledge keeper. Um, Tupaia, I love his work too. He, um, he, f he also had access to the um, illustrator's materials. So he did a number of drawings which are held in the uh, British Library and the British Museum. But also because he conducted many of the welcome ceremonies, we think, I think, Dame Anne Salmond poses in her book that a lot of the gifts that are now in the museums, uh, Cambridge Museum, Oxford and the British Museum, were actually inten intentionally given, gifted from the local people to Tupaya because he was the one holding the ceremonies and running the ceremonies. Um, Oh, these are just some images of thinking about, I knew I had, I had the endeavour as a, a 3D element in the background, so I really, um, with the getting Venice, I was able to um, spend some more time and refine the work. So I worked with another student, um, 3D animator, and I got him to animate some, some uh, waka for me. This is how we went about trying to create the soundtrack because we could never see the 32 minutes in one go. So this is me at the top. You can see there's, I'm numbering off the minutes so I could get a sense of where all the different scenes were. I worked editing this project uh, for four years and never heard a word. And then a week before the show opened was really the first time I heard the whole lot of the sound together. It was a real cacophony. And so it was um, a shock to me, but a, a lovely shock. But I had to sort of work my way pick, picking through it and deciding what to include. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but one of the things that uh, In Pursuit of Venus, if you get a chance to see it, what I love about it is that there's always a lot of people looking at it. There's a lot of people looking at people. I think we're always interested in looking at people. It's another encounter with life. Um, and it was really exciting. So this is from the first night that it opened at Auckland Art Gallery. I also, this is a, we made a curved version of it for the Campbelltown Art Centre recently. Just looking at the time. We started a bit late. Yes, we have one more time question. Okay. Okay, so I'll look, I will, <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll try and whip through. I, one of the things that I loved was working with um, the Tahitian chief mourner because he is a figure 
that Tupaya was looking at. Tupaya did an illustrated, illustrated drawing of this particular figure and they started collecting his costume on their second voyage, but by that time, his cultural practice had shifted. It, it no longer existed. So one of the things that happened when uh, there's the Oceania exhibition has just been at the Royal Academy. It's about to open in Paris in a couple of weeks' time. But I was able to work with the British Museum. I wrote um, a piece for their in-house magazine to try and um, excite them about the costume and to, um, to uh, refurbish it. It's now on show. An exhibition opened in no, uh, December of last year. Uh, but I went, they showed me what they were doing there in the conservation department. And um, it was really amazing because this costume has never been seen um, since then, since the 1700s, and it's the first time it's gone on show. And because I, I'd made my own version of the costume, sight unseen, because we don't have one in New Zealand, um, I was able to talk to them about um, the weight of the costume and how the actor had to move within it, because there was a number of parts to their costume and they weren't quite sure where the different pieces sat. Um, this is a, on the right hand side, there's a drawing. It was um, attached to an artist easel and it was kind of jimmied together in this very strange way. And inside the costume were other um, articles and um, a carving that they didn't know was in there. So they found these beautiful um, examples of work that they didn't even know that they had. Um, and it was great for me to be able to talk through um, what it was like for Ali to wear this. Uh, because this particular costume, I've since made another work called Taifatuki House of Death. Uh, this costume comes out after a chief dies and kind of wreaks merry hell and has the, the chief mourner has the right to kill people if they get in his way. So, you know, it's kind of quite a strange and very powerful piece. Uh, but I, I'd seen it inside the green screen studio. I really wanted to take it out onto the landscape and see how it worked in the landscape and what it meant if you're around trees and when Ali's standing in it, he's about seven feet high. And so there are the attendants that help him on either side and why you need those people. There's a whole, it's about um, five millimetres round and that's the only thing that he can see through and it's in this mask here. So we talked about that and I was able to help them think through the presentation of that work. The other thing we did um, was create a catalogue and it was a wonderful opportunity for me to kind of pick through some of the research um, aspects that I've done through the creation of this work. Um, and what we have on the cover is um, my female Captain Cook, uh, Julia Waite, uh, a woman I met who told me that when she was growing up she was called Cookie um, and she's six foot four, which is the same height as Captain Cook was. And when she turned her head in profile, she really did look like Captain Cook. So I decided I wanted to include her in this work. The work is actually 64 minutes, two sets of 32. There's one scene which I call gender with a question mark. And it's to do with ways of seeing. And of course, Pacific people didn't know of Captain Cook. They sort of thought of him almost like a godlike because he arrived in this strange new craft, you know, a very different kind of watercraft with the white billowing sails, etc., And because he wore breeches, and because he didn't have sex, like a lot of the others, Banks and the crew members were engaging in. There's one scene where I have a, um, a, a Tahitian man go to pull down his pants. Um, and so I wanted to play with that idea about ways of seeing. So I have Julia, we just shot the scene twice, once with a male cook and one with a female cook. Um, for me, getting Venice was fantastic because Camberton Art Centre supported me to um, accrue some visual material from Australia. I came here in 1988. Um, I worked with Bumali, 
Um, I've been coming here for a very long time. I love and hate this country in, in, in the best possible ways. But um, for me, the way that um, some of the Indigenous people are represented in the wallpaper, I wanted to cut across that and bring them forward and make them feature them very much um, close up in the work. So um, that's my kind of speaking back to it. Um, it was wonderful. In the book, we found a, um, this is the Endeavour replica, and what we love about it is the Aboriginal flag flying on. So really talking about kind of contemporary times and what these things mean. I'll leave it there, because um, I can. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. You've really brought that to life. And I just thought I should point out that In Pursuit of Venus, in fact, it is still on um, display at um, the um, APT in, um, in Queensland, and it will be for another month, I think, at least. Um, yes, and it's about to open in Samstag um, for the Arts Festival, and it's yeah. also going to 10 days in, on the island in Tasmania. And um, it's been really nice working with the Tasmanian group because we've decided to show it in a place called Burnie, mm -hmm. not to sort of um, put it in a big, you know, like Launceston or Hobart, mm -hmm. but take it to a smaller community and in a way to try and entice people to uh, investigate the mm. island and the, the communities in a really different manner. I think that would be a very powerful place to go and see it, actually. Um, I would like to thank Lisa very much for making this effort to come to the conference and to explain and bring to life her work, which she did so beautifully. Thank you very much. And um, as a small token of our appreciation, I'd like to thank you for half of the NGA.